So welcome everyone. Uh, good evening to most of you. Uh, it's Thursday's Clinical Spotlight and I'm Tracy Jarvis, the Director of PESI UK. And we've got a real special guest on the uh, webinar tonight. We've got um, uh, trauma uh, specialist Babette Rothschild, who has really, you know, put trauma on the map. So uh, Babette, a uh, warm welcome to you. And if I could just get you to pop on your video. Hi. Hi. So Vivette, let's start off. Um, can you say a little bit about why psychotherapists, counselors, mental health professionals are more prone to burnout and vicarious trauma? Um, the main reason is because helping professionals tend to be empathetic empathizers. Um, they score quite high on empathy scales. And um, uh, just in general, we tend to believe that resonating with our clients is the best way to help them, um, not realizing that sometimes it's not a good idea to keep resonating. Um, and that one can be very caring and um, uh, very caring. Uh, I'm sorry, I just was distracted by myself. Ellen's green. Um, very caring and um, uh, helpful, and can even think better if you pull back a little and turn down the resonance. But upping the resonance, the more you resonate with a client, the more you try to feel with them the more you try to imagine and even picture their experience, the more vulnerable you're gonna to be to be affected and infected by their distress. Mm. Say a little bit about, um, or explain a little bit about sort of empathy and the neurobiology of empathy, somatic empathy. Um, that's a really long topic. I know, we've um, got 45 it's, it's, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's a natural thing that humans do. Um, uh, some animals do. It's a very natural thing, most people to some degree. Um, uh, doctors and surgeons tend to be low on the empathy scale. That doesn't mean they don't care about people. Uh, empathy means you're feeling with somebody. Compassion, caring is feeling about somebody. And you can definitely care about without feeling with, and doctors prove that all the time. They couldn't do their work, they couldn't do the things that cause pain in the service of healing if they were empathizing all the time. It wouldn't be possible. So, um, uh, so neurobiology, um, well, we have a lot of things in our brain that help us um, suss the other person or the group or whatever. And um, some of that is what they call mirror neurons. And then there are also other things that work, just our own um, capacity to feel our own bodies, our own emotions. Um, for, let me give you an example. Usually when you're in uh, close contact with somebody, you often have the same facial expression. And, you know, if you want to test this out when you're able to go back to the coffee bars, you know, watch two people having a conversation and one smiles, the other smiles, one frowns, the other frowns, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And when you have a facial expression, there's something called facial feedback. Feedback, The way your shape is arranged affects how you feel. That's why like, you know, if somebody's in a bad mood, somebody obnoxious might say, come on, smile. You know, come on, lift up those sides of your mouth. Come on, smile. Because they know that if you are forced to smile, it will, as annoying as it is, it will change how you feel. And, uh, you know, that song, put on a happy face, you know, kind of thing. So, um, and the same is true for adverse emotions. So if you have a client who's upset, they're crying, their brow is furrowed, whatever, or they're depressed, and you 
mirror copy their facial expression, you're going to feel the same thing. And because if not because they're putting that feeling into you, but because from that your own facial feedback loop, you can share that feeling because your body knows what to emotion to convey when your face is arranged in a particular way. Um, and so, uh, and we do this so automatically. It just happens all the time. Body posture too. I don't know if you've read stuff on, I'm, I'm one of my lockdown um, pleasures is binge watching Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> and a couple of episodes ago, one of the surgeons who was having a particularly bad day and facing a particularly difficult surgery was standing in a superhero pose in the scrub room. And one of her colleagues came in and says, what are you doing? And she said, well, I've read that if you stand in a superhero pose for two minutes, you will start feeling like a superhero. So they both stood there with their hands on their hips, you know, like Wonder Woman, you know, kind of thing and whatever. But it's true. You know, if you go around like this, you're going to feel in general much worse than if you go around like this. And it's also because of the the feedback loop that comes from your proprioceptors, your, how your body is arranged in space. So if you're copying your client, facial expression, body posture, you're gonna feel with them. And then is the important task of separating, wait a minute, if I in my background have feelings like this, how do I know whether I'm feeling my feeling or if I'm feeling their feeling? So it's really good to only do that kind of copy, make it aware, be aware of it, mindfully aware, only do it for a minute or two so you can suss them and then stop it, get back to your own posture, get back to your own facial expression so that you can separate it out. Because otherwise you sometimes go home or go back into the room with the rest of the family or whatever it is and blow a gasket because your client's been angry and you didn't realize you were so resonating with that, that you have all this anger that's actually from resonating, not from your own system. Mm, very true. Do you separate out empathy and somatic empathy or? Empathy is somatic. Yeah, I just wanted to check. It, does, it doesn't, I, I haven't, I mean, there can be things that, that come across like a spiritual plane, but um, but otherwise empathy is a very physical thing. Mm. Talk a little bit about sort of, um, and you mentioned it earlier on, you're talking about mirror neurons and a really important point about sort of mirroring and then unmirroring in the treatment of trauma. That was a statement, I don't know what you're asking. Sure. So when we Sorry. mirror someone, we've just been talking about mirroring. Right, 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 right. right. And I want you to talk a little bit more about sort of mirroring in the treatment of trauma. And when we unmirror, like when do we go, mm, okay, enough, I don't want to mirror what's going on over well, there. Well, it's, it's sort of like I said, you'd really only want to do it a very short time to, to get a sense of them, to suss them. And because if you're in it with them, you know, think of it that like, my best picture for it is like the client's down in the pit, okay? If you get down there in the pit with them, how can you help them out? Mm. You have to be outside on the firm terra firma to be able to throw them the rope and be able to help them out of that pit. So if you're down in the pit with them, your ability to think clearly, to problem solve, to move through things to see possibilities, et cetera, becomes just as handicapped as those. And that's why a lot of, you know, a lot of therapists will come to supervision or consult with me and they say, I'm feeling so helpless. I don't know what to do with my client. What's going on with the client? Well, they're helpless. They don't know what to do. Ah, hmm. Let's yeah. talk about how much you've been resonating, empathizing with them and how can you get on your own terra firma because otherwise you won't be able to think clearly. You can't have that uh, project professional objectivity that our clients are paying for. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
that they need us for. If they want somebody in the pit with them, they've got friends and family and all sorts of other people who are, who are down there with them. They need us to be on terra firma. Right, right, right. So I hear what you're saying, and I think this sort of leads very nicely into you know, turning what we're talking about towards the therapist and talk about the importance of why it's important for therapists to track their own activation and their own internal arousal. So, um, I actually have a tool for this, you know, my ANS, I'll just briefly flash it. ANS table. Yeah. We'll, which we'll talk about on your workshop in depth. Um, you want to be able to observe your clients' autonomic nervous system and what's going on with them when you're working with trauma. You also want to be able to track your own for the reason of not wanting to land in that pit with them. So if you don't monitor your own autonomic arousal and know when you're going into a danger zone of losing your ability to think clearly, then you can end up really in trouble. So, um, and if you get into trouble, your client's gonna be in even more trouble. Mm. I wanna- so, and, we, and, and we do have a growing body of research that shows that trauma therapists who practice mindful awareness during sessions, and that doesn't mean constant. It means, you know, you ask your client to check in with themselves, you check in with yourself. You're asking them, you know, what temperature your toes, check out your toes, whatever that you, you check in with yourself periodically, that therapists who do that greatly decrease their risks for vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue and burnout. Mm. And I wanna rewind. And the reason why I wanna rewind is because we've got probably um, lots of people on here who are, might be, you know, been in the trauma game for some long, uh, some time practicing. And we might have some new therapists or students on this, on, on this webinar as well. So just in very simplistic terms, with bed, how do, you know, how do folk, uh, track their internal arousal? So, you know, because this might be a new concept to some people on this webcast, like well, again, that's a, a topic for a longer workshop. Um, uh, but um, uh, simple, very simple body awareness and self-awareness. You know, temperature of your hand, speed of your breath, um, uh, temperature of your toes. Um, uh, uh, what you're feeling emotionally, what kind of thoughts are your own, you know, all sorts of things, images you're getting in your head, et cetera. Um, but for the, the body tracking, it's just, it's very, it, you know, it's very simple. Anyone who's ever done like a body scan or whatever, but just temperature, respiration, heartbeat, if you can feel it, a lot of people can, it, don't worry about it if you can't. Um, sensations in your stomach, uh, differences in your muscles, tense, relaxed. Um, if there's a place that goes numb or <clears throat> places in your body that you don't have track of, you know, kind of thing, they like disappear, you know, or whatever, uh, particularly paying attention to your facial expression, you know, and such. Mm. So what I hear you saying is that if therapists are getting dysregulated in session is to somehow come back to observing the body. So for example, like you're talking about tracking the temperature in your hands or your feet, noticing your sitting bones on the chair or your back against the chair or wh wh whatever it is, your feet on the floor. Um, and that seems to apply some breaks in their, uh, what, what their autonomic system in terms of just bringing and, that prefrontal cortex back online. Right. And if that's happening to you, it's very likely that's happening to your client. So it's something you can do together. Slow things down. If the, if the therapist is getting too wound up, slow things down. Even if your client's not, it's not likely, but e e even if your client's not, 
if you're getting toward danger zone, you have to slow things down because otherwise you're not going to be there for them. Right. One of the things, and, and if you don't, if you forget, you end the session and go, oh my God, I never once checked in with myself. Shoot. So set an alarm on your phone together with the client, a little meditation bell on the timer or something every 15, 20 minutes and tell the client ahead of time just to able, so that we pace ourselves here and keep our frontal cortex functioning every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, whatever it is, my phone's gonna make a little chime. And when that happens, whatever we're doing or talking about, we're both gonna stop, sit back in our chairs, feel the chairs supporting us, feel our feet on the floor, take two or three deep breaths, and then go on with whatever we were doing. Um, it's like a reboot. Yeah. And therapists who think you, you should never interrupt the client really should rethink whether they should work with trauma because trauma clients, trauma processes, if you want to do that safely, you have to interrupt. You have to make friends with that. I know it's, it's hard, particularly for a lot of therapists in the UK who are trained in person-centered and um, uh, other kinds of process-oriented integrative you know, kind of therapies um, because they're taught never ever to interrupt. And that's fine for some types of psychological issues. But when you're dealing with volatile, dysregulating trauma, you have to interrupt. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So given a little example, um, just about, you know, how might a therapist do that? They might they, I don't know, over to you rather than me saying. Well, well, for, for one, you can, you can program it in. For another, um, like I've had clients who were really out of control, dysregulated, and I say, stop, stop for a minute. I need to ask you a question. Stop. Take a look around you. Tell, tell me what color the walls are. Tell me um, uh, what temperature your toes are. Um, what time's on the clock. Um, and sometimes you have to be really assertive about it. You def If a client like is in a flashback or is super dysregulated otherwise, sometimes you have to be loud because those kind of processes can really decrease their ability to hear you. Mm. Um, I was once uh, some years ago doing one of my longer trainings in uh, the UK in London. Um, we were sitting around, something was going on, somebody sitting over here got really triggered and flipped into flashback. Just as we were discussing theory, I think. I stopped what we were doing, I got her attention, I helped get her awareness back in the room, away from the flashback. She calmed down, she, her awareness became present. And five people in the room were furious with me. Why were you yelling with her? Why, you know, that was so mean, that was terrible. Why were you mad? And I turned to her and I said, how did you experience that? And she said, I felt like you threw me a, a life preserver and you were really mean. And um, she wouldn't have, if I would have said, Tracy, Tracy, look at me. Tracy, where are you right now? She wouldn't have been able to hear me. Mm. So sometimes you have to, to up, the, up the volume. And that's safer to do than say to grab them physically. Somebody with trauma, you don't wanna just reach out and grab them because especially if they're in flashback that can, just totally merge with the flashback. But mm. you can stand outside confident, calm, not angry, but loud. As loud as is necessary to get their attention. And for sure, you need to talk with clients when they're not in that kind of a state and explain to them, you know, this is how this is gonna work for safety's sake. I can't just let you stay in a flashback or in a dysregulated state. That will um, uh, have the potential to make things even harder for you. So I will be stopping you. I will be interrupting you. 
Um, and sometimes I might sound loud. It won't be because I'm angry. It's because I'm needing to get your attention away from what's distressing you and into the present moment where there's no danger. Makes a lot of sense. And I think, yeah, you, I think what you're sort of saying is that there is a spectrum between how people get activated. And on one side, you know, there's mild activation. On the other end, if someone's in a massive flashback, uh, I myself know that even if you just talk like we're talking, nothing's going to get in. So you have to kind of get them out. Um, and yeah, you have to. yeah, yeah, seen that before. Um, Babette, I want to talk a little bit about, I was preparing for this and reading your book once again, which is a great book for everyone who's on Which here. one? I have six books, which one? <laughs> what, what book do you think that I was researching for this? Uh, probably volume two, right? Right. Uh, the body remembers volume two, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I was looking at, you know, the book and just getting some questions together and talk a little bit about sort of empathetic imagery in the context of oh, this. Oh, that's Help for the Helper, actually. Sorry, Help for the Helper. Yes, yes, not the volume two. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about empathetic imagery and how to use that in session. How not to use it. Uh, how not to, but when it comes up, like what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So some of us in our, just automatically in our systems and some of us in our training education have gotten the idea that when somebody's telling us a story, a history of whatever's happened to them, that we should picture that in our mind. And some people in doing that imagery, whether it's automatic or purposeful, will generate the imagery as if they're watching it on a TV screen or in a movie theater. And some will imagine it as if they're the victim, as if things are happening to them, imagining what something feels like, imagining. And oftentimes when they do that, since they weren't in the place where the, that the client is describing, so they can't imagine that, they imagine their own environment mm. or their childhood environment or whatever, anyway. When you generate imagery, and, and understandably, you're doing that for the purpose of hoping that you will be able to better understand whatever it is that's going on with them or whatever it was that happened to them, but it has huge risks to you. One of the main categories of uh, vulnerability to develop PTSD is being a witness to trauma. And when you generate imagery, you become a witness. Correct. Okay. Um, it's the worst, it's the most danger if you're imagining it happening to you, especially if anything like whatever it is actually did happen to you getting those things mixed up in your own system is highly possible, very dangerous for your, for your own mental health. Um, the other thing is when somebody's telling you about the car accident that they had or when they were raped or whatever, unless you were actually there, whatever imaging your, images you're generating are, aren't true. They're your fantasy. So it actually doesn't really help you understand what happened to them because you're making up your own story about their story. Yeah. Right? So it actually really doesn't help them and it has great risk to you. So I recommend people not to do that. And when we do a help for the helper training, we train in different ways to, to, um, to reduce that. Mm. Do you find that some therapists are naturally more prone to just automatically yeah, generating? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Of course, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, so, it's human uh, nature. It's also, I'll say, it's not 100% because I know really 
seasoned therapist to do that, but it is more prevalent among newer therapists. Mm. A lot of therapists just naturally, as they get more experience, sort of catch on to the idea themselves. This isn't such a great idea, but not everybody does by any means. And certainly not every new therapist generates imagery. Um, but it is all these things that all these things are um, have the poten huge potential to be able to learn to control them and, and be in charge of them. There's nothing in this that you have to feel victimized by by any means. Yes. So let's move a little bit on to um, I want to move on to sort of projective identification. I know we are sort of running sh through these things at like a fast pace and we could be spending days on each question. But before we start on projective identification, maybe Babette, just explain sort of transference and counter transference and then we'll go into it because again there might be some people on this uh, webcast who don't know some of the terminology. I think you need to, for me, you need to define projective identification as you're thinking of it, um, because there are different ways to look at it. And so to be able to understand your question, that would be helpful to me. So, um, so let's go to, so transference and counter-transference. Are those some of how you would be describing things first in your brain? Or... I think I think fairly agreed upon. Uh, transference are feelings that the the client brings from their own background that they um, uh, bring into the therapy room, basically, and bring to the therapist. So, you know, if the therapist has a particular facial expression one day, the client from their own background. You know, might you know might be like, oh, you're angry with me. Well, and if the therapist explores this with the client, find out, well, when my mother had that facial expression, she was angry with me. You know, kind of thing. So that's transference. Counter transference is what the therapist brings into the room from their background. Um, and uh, equally so can can be can be used beneficially in ways to that where it increases their understanding of the client based from their background as long as they remember just because this happened to me doesn't mean it was the same experience for the client just because this was helpful to me has no bearing on whether it's going to be helpful to the client whatever it is one of the biggest mistakes we make as therapists is this helped me so it's going to help you it didn't help you so what are you doing wrong you must not really want to get better because that helped me. So that definitely will help you if you're actually serious about getting help. Yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully nobody who's listening does that, but there, you know, it's a very common therapeutic position kind of thing. And it's a big mistake. Um, I know what's best for you. Well, you actually don't. You know what would be best for yourself in that situation? That doesn't mean that's what's best for the client. Mm. Yeah. So, and those are examples I would say of not particularly helpful counter transference. Um, uh, helpful counter transference can be okay. Yes, we share that experience, and um, I can suss you right now, and maybe we talk about how we experience that differently or. Tell me about how that is for you. And the therapist not pushing that on the client or assuming that that's the client's um, experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with that in mind, just going on to projective identification um, and again, the various different modalities might talk about the concept in different ways. Um, client brings in something that they're not holding properly in themselves. And sometimes that can move into the therapist and say, for example, like um, oh, it's another example. So, you know, uh, anger, uh, senses of shame. So where a therapist doesn't usually feel these intense experiences, sometimes that's then left with the therapist to carry. 
Can you talk a little bit about that process as you understand it and how like in trauma, um, you know, that, that kind of plays out? Well, I might disappoint you here, Tracy, because I don't believe in that. Okay. I don't, I don't think that a client can put anything in me that I don't make myself vulnerable for or take into myself. I've asked clients to try it. You can try it right now. Try to put a feeling there's in no ways that that would work because in some ways I don't believe about it either. <laughs> so, okay. I, I read so, it in the book. What, what, what I was talking about before about empathy and uh, resonance and how you can increase your resonance or decrease it and the danger of increasing it is getting that confusion about whose feeling is whose. Yeah. Um, that's what I believe is projective identification that you actually turned up your vulnerability either naturally or on purpose and forgotten about it and made yourself vulnerable to resonate with this client. And you can resonate with things that are on the surface. You can resonate with things that are under the surface. Um, but it's very important you distinguish what's the client's and what's your own. And in that way, you can never, um, uh, have the situation where you feel like a client put something in you, um, which is a horrible thing for the therapeutic relationship. Oh my God, I have this client who's always putting these horrible feelings in me. It's very client blaming. And it means the therapist is a victim and can't do anything about it. Exactly. I, I, I just don't believe it. Exactly. And I really like and I, and, I've had, and, and I've had some really heated discussions with colleagues about it because it's, in some schools of thought, it's a very controversial idea. Absolutely, and I, th and I think that this is where kind of we expand some of the boundaries in our thinking and kind of evolving the field because I really like the IFS idea, the internal family systems model of even counter transference that something in the therapist is getting activated to something in the relationship and or like you're saying, the the therapist vulnerability it's got nothing to do with the with the with, with the client. Something in the therapist is vulnerable to them carrying the emotion or doing whatever. So I really I really love that, and we're on the same page. Uh, yeah, I think as a profession, we blame our clients too much. Absolutely, and um, and that that's um, uh, that's very unfortunate. Very, very unfortunate. Um, I love to talk about client resistance. Have I talked with you about that, Tracy? I can't no, remember. go ahead. Go ahead. We've got time. Okay. So I have my own take on client resistance. I haven't read this anywhere else. I'm sort of proud of it. Um, if, I'm, if I could see everybody, I'd be asking them, like, how many of you have a problem with client resistance and which wish that your clients weren't resistant and you know, most everybody raises their hand. So my response to that is get over it. Without client resistance, you're out of a job. Um, if a client doesn't have resistance, they don't need you. Their resistance help pays your, helps to pay your rent. Mm. It's, part, it's part of their job description. Yeah, their role. Just, just, just like a teenager, part of their job description is to test every boundary and limit you ever have. Part of a client's job description is to be resistant because if they weren't, they wouldn't need to. Mm. Yeah. So the more you can embrace it and say, oh, this is part of my job, then the less you're burdened by clients when they're resistant and you can better team up with them mm. to help them with it rather than feel like if, if, if you don't like, if, if, you're, if you feel victimized by client resistance, then you're always fighting them with it. You're not teeping, teaming up with them to help them with it. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, and kind of, I really like, you know, brings in sort of some of uh, Janina Fisher's work and others around really kind of utilizing those, you know, defense reactions as a way to moving the therapy forward um old old school 
old school psychotherapy. If you go back to the old books from the 50s and the 60s, a very common tenant is to respect and go with the resistance. It's not new. Mm. It's not a new idea. But we there's a actually I'm thinking about writing a book, um, uh, something something about you know let's not forget the old stuff, you yeah. know kind of thing, because um, uh, some of that old wisdom with all our new and modern theories and methods and whatever we forget all this great old wisdom. Mm. Go with the resistance. Mm. It's there for a reason. Um, there's I, lots in it that's important. I think you should write that book. We'll publish it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Norton would compete with you for that, my publisher. But um, uh, I'll, I'll remember Pessy if they turn me down. But I'm pretty, I'm a pretty good. I have a pretty good track record with W. W. Norton. They like me. I know you do. I was just uh, I was just uh, yeah poking you a bit. So uh, let's spend the last eight minutes or so um, talking about therapist self-care and really um, you will certainly what's in your book. There's some really good stuff. So perhaps let's just start off with, um, uh, you know, for therapists to think more clearly, be more, uh, how can I say, uh, regulated, in sessions, between sessions, what are your thoughts around the hows of how therapists do that, especially if they've got like a full caseload or a lot of their cases, all trauma clients or? Well, I wouldn't recommend people have all trauma clients because it's really demanding and can be draining. And um, I think it's good to have a variety and have other things to do also, but everybody has to figure that out for themselves. Um, but also particularly during this time with, with this crazy year that's con starting to extend into a second year of COVID and lockdown and working from home and whatever. I want to say one thing that most people aren't talking about. I mean, everybody who's listening, I think they probably in general know a lot about self-care. And when I do self-care trainings, the issue is less um techniques and methods for taking care of themselves they know all that it's that they don't do it and making time for it and making sacred space for it and that kind of thing but one of the things i've noticed as i do um a lot of online webinars is way is therapists uh, too many therapists have their computers in their bedroom and when we talk about projective identification or sussing or resonating or whatever, do you really want your clients in your bedroom when you go to bed at night? You know, do you really want them there with your partner when you're having sex? You know, get your computer out of your bedroom. And I know sometimes it's hard, especially if you have a smaller space or um, if you're living together with a lot of other people but I guarantee you self-care will be easier if you designate a separate space, not in your bedroom. It will also impact client transference because they shouldn't be seeing your bedroom. Right. Um, and um, it's something a lot of people have done for convenience and because of these extenuating circumstances. But I really implore, even if you have to set up at the dining room table and then knock it down because you have a meal together or whatever. Take the time to do that so that your clients are not in your bedroom. I can nearly guarantee you, you will sleep better. Um, your clients will be let, less nosy about your life. Um, uh, there'll be better boundaries all, all, all around. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And um, so for those of you who are new uh, on the webcast, uh, we're going to go into some Q&A in a little while. So rather than putting your questions in the chat functionality, please pop them in the Q&A. Uh, I will get there in a couple of minutes. So uh, but that, that's a really good point about, you know, people, I think what you're sort of also alluding to is 
you know, we are in this sort of crazy world and some people do have smaller spaces, but I think there's sort of boundaries uh, that comes into sort of some boundary work and just sort of really thinking about, you know, an appropriate boundary space for working with clients. Um, there's a question in the chat sort of talking about sort of rituals and um, I don't know, shaking down or doing some kind of rituals after sessions just to sort of take some of that energy away. Is that something that you have seen uh, be helpful for therapists or? Whatever helps the therapist helps the therapist. So if somebody's saying, I do this, is it okay? If it helps you, it's okay. Um, uh, it's so individual. You know, what helps your colleague isn't going to help you and vice versa. You can inspire each other. Um, I think it's great to exchange ideas, but not to push anything on somebody. For somebody, this supplement's really good. For another person, you know, this exercise is really good. For another person, um, uh, eating chocolate, you know, is really good. And there'll be people that, that's like ah, the worst thing, any of those things, you know, whatever. So it's really, really, really important to um, individualize and find what works for you. And, um, and to, I'll, I'll say it's like I said, I think people know, people know about rituals. They know about taking breaks. They know about good nutrition. They know about exercise. They know about talking with colleagues and friends and taking time off. They know all these things. The problem is more making the space for them and really feeling like you have a right to take care of yourself. Yeah. That's more the issue I find with people. And, um, uh, and when you decide, okay, I'm going to do this for myself. Like say somebody says, I've heard meditation is good. I'm going to do meditation. I'm going to do an hour meditation every every morning. I'm going to get up an hour early. I'm going to do an hour meditation. And they don't really want to get up that early. And so they set the clock later and then they, you know, try it and they're falling asleep, um, you know, and then they get frustrated. Well, wait a minute. If you've never meditated before, an hour is too long to start. Right. Maybe a half an hour is too long to start. Maybe 15 minutes is too long to start. Maybe if you just effectively were able to be mindful for 60 seconds exactly. at a shot, one minute, and be successful at that, then awesome. And maybe that is enough for you once in a day or three times in a week or three times in a day or whatever. And maybe it's successful in a way that you say, oh, I'll try two minutes. Mm. But whatever it is, exercise, oh, I'm going to go jog you know, five kilometers. Well, wait a minute. How about you try just jogging around the block first? Mm -hmm. Or maybe just jogging down to the corner first and build up, always aim for something small enough that you're sure it'll be successful so that you can build on it rather than trying to totally revamp your whatever and failing. You can also apply this with clients, you know, when, when they make assignments for themselves or you give them homework, a lot of times it's not successful because it's too much. Mm. Somebody who's afraid to go out, you say, well, go to the shopping mall, you know, once, once a week. Well, maybe that's way too much for them. Maybe it's big enough challenge for them to walk to their side, open their front door and walk to the sidewalk and walk back in the door. Yes. Start with something they can do successfully and feel the success of it and then build on that. Mm. I, I, you know, I have to say, there's two things I forgot to say at the start. One is the main thing I have to sell is common sense. Um, and these things, they're all common sense. The other is to remember that all the theories you learn, anything you talk about, whether it's in neuroscience, trauma theory, whatever it is, it's theory. And theory is not the same as fact. Theory is a fancy speculation. I'm not saying they're not good to use, but don't overrate them. A theory is a speculation. It may be agreed upon speculation. It's still a speculation. It's an opinion. 
You know the DSM that we all rely on for our diagnose, diagnostic categories. So the DSM-5 is like this, right? So the DSM-1 was like this. Mm. I have the DSM-1 and 2 are so small that I have the files in PDF on my iPad. <laughs> The, the DSM-3 was the first one to get sort of thick, but if you look in the DSMs and compare them from the different volumes, diagnostic categories change. Their diagno and diagnostic categories increase, they change, some get eliminated. Psychopath was a diagnostic category for a long time. It doesn't exist in DSM-5. Mm. So how do you get the DSM? You get a lot of people getting together, arguing their different points of view, their different opinions, and then coming to a consensus of what the different categories should be and what the criteria should be in the different categories. It's not a book of facts. It's a book of opinions. And so, and so two things also, because we've disagreed a little bit here. Disagreement's important because nothing changes without disagreement. Nothing evolves without disagreement. And um, my favorite slogan about myself is I get paid for my opinion. I don't get paid to be right. So if anybody's coming to any more of the stuff we do together, they have to know all they're going to get are opinions. No facts. Exactly. Exactly. We, I mean, I, I, I think talking about the DSM as a whole other week, I mean, year, you know, I mean, yeah, it's based on kind of like mouse models. Um, I mean, that's a whole other thing. I've just read that. That's not, well, I like that. I never heard that before. I mean, like, look at Judith Herman, who's been trying for decades, decades to get the diagnosis of complex PTSD into the DSM. She can't get enough consensus, so it's not mm. in there. Well, PTSD just got reclassified in the DSM-5. Uh, it's not an anxiety disorder because um, it's way too bearable and complex. It used to be right. like anxiety disorders. They used to prescribe SSRIs, which were made for anxiety and depression on mouse models. And now in the DSM-5, they've reclassified it. I mean, look at that. That's incredible. I was in, um, a couple of decades ago, I was at uh, uh, Trump International Society for Traumatic Stress traumatic stress studies conference and they were one of the seminars they were having the big argue, this big argument about whether PTSD was an anxiety disorder or a, a dissociative disorder and I wanted I, I hadn't written any books yet and I didn't have any confidence but in the U.S. we used to have these mints called certs and the commercial was certs is a breast mint Certs is the candy mint, and they'd be arguing whether it was a breath mint or a candy mint. <laughs> and then somebody would crash through the argument and say, Stop, you're both right. It's both. It's a certs is the candy mint and the breath mint. And I wanted to do that in that argument and stand up and say, Stop, you're both right. PTSD is an anxiety disorder, it is a dissociative disorder. It's two disorders in one. And um, actually, it's probably even more than that. But, um, but these things, they have to be argued and changed so long as we keep what is the theory in perspective and that the argumentation is important because you're never going to evolve without it. Mm. If you only agree with each other, if you only keep people around you who agree with you, well, we have an example of that from the last four years in my government. If you only keep people around you who agree with you, all you have is a mess. You need to have people around you who disagree so that you can have to think and that they challenge you. And, you know, yeah. if you're afraid for your client to disagree with you, you're in the wrong business. Yeah, totally agree. I, I could be talking to you all night. This is great. Now, let's move on to some questions because we've got 10 minutes left. Um, and uh, I'm going to read them out so you can just relax. Just one at a time, please. <laughs> What do you think that's going to read all like 10 of them? <laughs> okay, let me just pick one that will speak to everyone. Um, I, hear, I think this is an interesting question for you. And I, I think it's, it, it's really relevant to the UK because in some ways I find uh, some of our trainings backwards um, and I feel quite you know clear about my thinking around that. Um, 
why do you think the body and the nervous system is still left out in so many therapeutic trainings when nonverbal trauma enters so many sessions with clients? Ask that once more. Yeah. Why do you think the body and nervous system is still left out in so many therapeutic trainings when nonverbal trauma enters so many sessions with clients? Because trauma is the issue that's changing psychotherapy. Before trauma, recognition of mind and body connection was fringy. We were the woo-woo people out on the fringes, gestalt, Reikian work, you know, those kinds of things were totally in the fringes. Um, Bessel van der Kolk in the 90s wrote an article called The Body Keeps the Score, which was the precursor of his book of the same title. And all of us, I'm, I come from a body background. I'm a somatic psychotherapist, a body psychotherapist. And we were just like gobsmacked. Oh my God, he just legitimized us. And everybody went and grabbed Bessel and brought him over to the body psychotherapy side. He didn't know about us, I don't think. And um, he became a member of the body psychotherapy organizations and he's, he's very beloved. Um, uh, Antonio Damasio, who's also written a lot about body-mind connection, he also didn't know about body psychotherapy, but he, um, in, in Descartes' Air, also brought a foundation for, but these are two revolutionary works. Prior to that, well, that's not totally true. Re Freud in his early days, especially in, um, when he was influenced by one of his students, Wilhelm Reich, did recognize the body-mind connection. And Janet, yeah, who Janet, from, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Janet, who we know from the um, phase-oriented model, um, he predated Freud and he was very aware of it. But Freud, it, in, as I understand the history of it, Freud was very much talking about this mind-body connection, but then that got into the sexual thing and there were all these rich people who had trauma that was based in sexual abuse. And that became a very, you know, remember Freud was very much uh, hanging around with a rich, um, you know, crowd and influential crowd. And that was a very unpopular view. So he left all that body stuff go and went to the id and the mind and focusing on that. He re so he rejected that. So, um, uh, and so that's the direction Freud and his talking cure is the direction that became the popular direction and then bring in the cognitive and the behavioral and then the merging of the cognitive behavioral. That's been very much the direction until the mid nineties, anything Bobby was on the fringes, but Damasio and Van der Kolk started making it legit to pay attention to the body. Um, and then that's been slowly happening. But remember, things change slowly and there's still plenty of schools that completely reject that. And working with body, working with neuroscience, the mind-body connection, um, the nervous system, that's a lot more, you can't do that. If that's what you're gonna do, you can't just sit back and listen to your client. It's a lot more work. And, um, and particularly with regard to trauma clients, it's a lot more volatile. Mm. So, um, so I think that it's a combination of old school versus new school. And also, um, uh, you know, like interrupting the client is a lot more work than just following them. Okay. Yeah. So I think saying laziness would be an unfair criticism, but something about um, a commitment to, to doing the harder work. Mm, mm. Yeah. And I think it's like what you were talking about earlier on is that kind of, you know, both and rather than either or is a way that we are, are, are going because actually some of the more analytic theories with some of the 
uh, relational complications is quite is quite complex. So having models where people are, you know, uh, using actually a number of models to inform treatment, whatever's working for the client, I think is where we're going. And that's not even to talk about psychedelics or neurofeedback with Sabern Fisher or any of the oh, other. Sorry, uh, don't get don't get me started on some of those, but. Um, uh... The, I had two major goals for my the first volume of the Body Remembers that was published in 2000. The one was to, and it was to make two bridges. One was to make a bridge between theory and treatment because psychotherapists really were totally not versed in theory. They were only taught techniques, really. Um, traumas also changed that. Um, and to build a bridge between the mind-oriented people and the body-emotional-oriented people to bring that together, to further that, which um, Damasio and, and Van der Kolk started. Mm. And because coming from somatic psychotherapy, we were all about everything from the neck down. And I've had to teach body psychotherapists that the head is part of the body. <laughs> yeah. And you have to teach cognitive oriented therapists, mind oriented therapists, that the body's not there only to carry the head around. Exactly. So you, you, they're interconnected, yeah. whether we like it or not, or whether we believe it or not, they're interconnected. Let's take uh, another question. Um, somebody says, with transference, how do you know whether client is projecting feelings onto the therapist or whether they are genuine feelings? E.g., if a client feels attracted towards their therapist, how does, how does you know if it is because they want to be looked after by a caring person or can it be as simple as they just have a crush attract attraction and that isn't a transference? I know where my head's going on that question, but I'll leave that one to you. Well, I'll tell you where my head's going with it. I don't think you should think too hard about it because you're not going to figure it out because the person who has the answer is the client. And so rather than racking your brain for trying to come up with a smart interpretation for the client, find ways to help the client explore and find their own answer about that. I think we as therapists work way too hard trying to figure clients out when they actually have every answer yeah yeah there's a lot of questions coming in about sort of uh the bedroom which i'm really just interesting as a parallel <laughs> as a parallel process to this talk um but there is a question here which i do want to just get your thoughts i'm, I'm sitting in my living room dining room where are you sitting I'm in my office, which is on my third okay. floor. So my bedroom's okay. nowhere, nowhere near. Okay. <laughs> um, somebody says, what about clients who are in their bedroom? I'm working with a trauma client. I'm concerned that she is in her bedroom. And I think that's such an important question because sometimes for rape or sexual abuse or that's, yeah. And we're talking trauma. Um, Because the client's just talking with the therapist usually one hour in a week, um, it may be more difficult to have them change the place. But I think you certainly both, client and therapist as part of your partnership, need to be aware of if the place where the client is working from has potential for triggering. If it's a place where they've actually experienced trauma, then I'd probably want to do more um, like if they were actually were raped in that bedroom, I would probably want to do more about um, separation, but you still can do time separation, anything you can do to separate, you know, and okay, so that happened here, you got to get used to your bedroom again anyway. And so how do you know that's not happening now? Yeah, you know, and continue to use your sensory nervous system, your extra receptors to pay attention and say, okay, well, Obviously, that person isn't here now. That smell isn't here now. Um, I smell the um, the flowers I have in here. 
I um, uh, I look around, I check under the bed, you know, all those kinds of things to make that separation because that's ultimately what they have to do anyway, is update the part of them who's always feeling in trauma to that it's not happening yeah. now or anymore, yeah? Yeah, makes a lot of sense. But Beth, we've got you for a whole three days we at, do at the end of March. So, um, right. uh, unfortunately, we're at the end of the hour, and I just want to say it's been uh, really fantastic just to have this interaction and and you just you know letting us know your thoughts about burnout and 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 and, and vicarious trauma. So, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And uh, you're very wait. welcome. Thank you for inviting me. This has been fun. We could go on for a few more days. We could go on for a we we, we 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 could do a whole seminar just of Q and A. We could do a whole seminar of Q Q and A. Maybe we maybe let's do a whole seminar of Q and A. After we do the three day. After we do the three day three day and get 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 our community kind of part of this. Right, right. Because I think we I think do. yeah I think this is uh, you know hearing what people are asking and having interaction as a tribe is really important. I agree. Yeah. Thank you so much, Babette, and thank you so much to everyone. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.